day two here in Johannesburg. I didn't really properly end yesterday's vlog, so I'm going to do that now. As you can tell, yesterday it pretty much started raining really, really heavily while I was wait making my way back from Soweto to Melville where I'm staying. I thought I would go out try to show you a little bit more of Melville, but the rain was just way too heavy to be able to do that. So I ended up changing my Uber destination to head back to my apartment. Um, I took a shower, rested, and then once the rain subsided, went out to Parkhurst, another area just north of Melville where there are a lot of restaurants and cafes and bars right out on the street. And uh, I met up with two friends, both from Johannesburg, and they gave me some great tips for what I should be doing today and tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to end this vlog. It's a small taste of Johannesburg. But don't worry, there's more coming in today's vlog. Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of Nonstop Nick Hill. I'm here in Gandhi Square in the heart of the CBD in Johannesburg right now. And I originally was not even planning on coming here. I came here by mistake actually when I thought that there was a South Indian restaurant right by here. I had my Uber take me there and it turns out that that restaurant doesn't even exist anymore. But instead I saw that just a block or two away is Gandhi Square so I figured I'd check it out. And the actual monuments here are quite powering. He was a racist, yes, he was. I know, I know. Uh, he was, he was. Uh, and yes, as you can see, uh, Gandhi was a quite controversial figure. In the US, it's a very li little known history, but he actually didn't really like black people in his time in South Africa. Nonetheless, none of that is written on the monument here. That's the non-dominant narrative, but it's maybe gaining traction and it's gaining traction from people here. Nonetheless, this is still a historic uh, spot and for a couple of reasons. Despite these very w widespread accusations of racism against uh, Gandhi, which I'm sure are factual, uh, he still did break some barriers here in South African society during a time when discolored people in general, be they Asian, be they black, be they Chinese, just didn't have many opportunities. So he was one of the first in his field, according to this plaque, in the legal profession and he practiced law not far away from here. This plaque right, right behind me actually states that, that Gandhi worked in court to defend the rights of colored people uh, including Indians and Chinese who were standing trial in a very unjust system. He himself also stood trial here for political offenses and was sentenced to his first term of imprisonment here in 1908 and so it was from this background of practicing law here in Johannesburg that Gandhi then took his philosophy to the Indian subcontinent. However today the square is very much a multi-functional mixed-use space right in the heart of the downtown area. This was the historic CBD in Johannesburg. It's the CBD which holds the name of the city, Johannesburg. However, due to decades of flight from this part of Johannesburg, the current economic center of the city has shifted northward towards the suburbs such as Santon. What I really feel when I'm here in the Johannesburg CBD is that I feel like I'm in the Midwest Rust Belt cities whose downtowns are in such decline. The buildings are probably vacant, they're old, they haven't really been renovated. There isn't really a lot of the economic activity that you would expect to see in one of Africa's largest cities. Especially if you compare to the downtowns that we've seen in Dakar or Abidjan, this isn't like that at all. And that's because the, the new center has shifted to the suburbs due to the high crime rate here in this part of the city. However, right now it's daytime. There are people out and about I'm right by a bunch of uh, the big uh, chain restaurants. We have Pizza Hut here, KFC, Vodacom has a site here. A D huge uh, Adidas showroom is right in front of me. So I feel pretty safe uh, vlogging. But at the same time, you probably wouldn't want to do this at night or in some of the more sketchy areas of downtown Johannesburg. So I just left the CBD area of Johannesburg and now I'm here in, it's called Fordsburg which is the historical center of the South Asian community here in Johannesburg. 
And that didn't just happen organically. That was because the apartheid regime sort of delineated this area as the space for South Asian businesses and South Asian uh, trading. So there's a huge plaza here where you have the hub of South Asian businesses. And then all around the streets, there are restaurants, uh, grocery stores, and the like. You can find pretty much anything you want here. So I, of all the businesses here, uh, chose the South Indian restaurant. You can hear people speaking Malayalam. And the menu features dosas, idlis, vadas, all the types of uh, veg, non-veg uh, curries you would want, biryanis, uh, there's thalis. Uh, but I am just uh, stopping here for like a brunch. So I had just had my plate of idlis. You know, I've been eating pretty well across my whole month and a half in West Africa. But there is nothing like coming, sitting down, having your simple plate of, of steamed idlis, your sambar, and your chutneys, and I'm waiting for my lamb dosa. And then after that, I think we should have about two hours before my next Airbnb experience starts in the area of Bramfontein. It's all these Dutch names that I'm having trouble exactly pronouncing with all their vowels and everything. Bramfontein, I think that's how you pronounce it. We'll do a street art walk there. But first we'll have our dosa, walk around Fordsburg, and then head over to that area and check out the street art there. I just left the restaurant and uh, some of the restaurant owners told me that there's a nice little market right around here and it's also Friday so it's very crowded out on the street so I turned into a little alleyway and it opened up into another alleyway full of a bunch of businesses restaurants salons little craft shops grocery stores there is like I don't know chat houses but you can pretty much find everything here and different business owners from different parts of the world the uh, Syrian Rose restaurant in front of me We've got a bunch of shawarma places, Pakistani and, Indian, Pakistani and Indian stores. You see a lot of Arabic here, a lot of uh, South Asian languages as well. There are also a bunch of uh, VHS and DVD stores here, which uh, I can't imagine are doing really well. All their doors are pretty much shut. The salons, grocery stores, all of that. Typical kind of uh, businesses which cater to the community here. I'd love to give you a whole rundown on South Asian, South Africans, or South Asians in South Africa, but that would easily turn into an hour-long documentary. You can definitely open up a Wikipedia page on South Asian, South Africans, and find out the entire story of how long they've been here, the different waves of, of immigration, how they've come to South Africa from all over the subcontinent to perform a variety of roles here in the South African society. There have been different waves of immigrants from the 19th century into the 20th century and even now into the 21st century and they've all faced different experiences when integrating into South African society. Now there are different populations of South Asians in different areas of South Africa. They're largely concentrated on the coast in Durban and the province which Durban belongs to, uh, which I don't remember the name of right now. Uh, but here in Johannesburg, and especially here in the Fordsburg area of Johannesburg, South Asians comprise about 50% of the population. So I was just told that, I mean, obviously because of Friday prayers, most of the shopkeepers have shut down and have gone to go pray in the mosques nearby. So there's actually not much activity going on in the market. Um, they were like, okay, after come back in like an hour or two after Friday prayers, and then you'll see this place is going to be full of people and very, very different atmosphere. I'm hoping that you got a little taste of what Fordsburg is like and all the diversity that exists here. Areas like this, where you have shops on the street, restaurants nearby, are all a little rare in most areas of, uh, of Johannesburg. For example, like where I'm staying in, in the northern suburbs, you don't normally find this. And that's kind of why I thought that, okay, Johannesburg isn't really a big city or how can it be such a big city? I don't see people out and about, but it's really in the neighborhoods like this, which are in the center. And a lot of people don't come here for fear of high crime rates and uh, just a general bad reputation for a lot of the neighborhoods, which aren't, I mean, I want to be honest, just heavily white. And this is not a neighborhood which is heavily white, so Weto is not heavily white. Um, but then you see like the neighborhoods we went to, like Parkhurst or the northern suburbs uh, we went to last evening, where you almost see only white people there. 
and everything's behind a gated fence or barbed wire and here everything's out in the open you only pretty much see other black or brown people and it's a completely different city than what we saw in the northern suburbs. I'm currently in the Bramfontein area to begin our art walk in this district and some of the neighboring districts of Johannesburg. But before coming here, I made one last stop in Fordsburg and that was Oriental Plaza. So I had no idea to expect that when I was there at Oriental Plaza. But that market actually sits on the site of what was known as Red Square. This was the site where many African and South Asian leaders would join together to agitate for the repeal of many of the unjust laws put into place by the apartheid government. This movement of agitation led the apartheid government to destroy the old site where most South Asian uh, traders would congregate and set up shop. And eventually in the 70s, Oriental Plaza was built in the Fordsburg area as a sort of compromise between the government and the traders to sort of set up some sort of area where they could continue their businesses. Stories like this, and also just what you see when you're walking around the city, makes it so clear just how important space or owning land or setting, being able to set up shop is towards building wealth. If you can keep people from owning land, building their own homes, from owning their own homes, from owning their own shop to setting up shop anywhere, that means you can, you can pretty much act as a gatekeeper for how much wealth they can build. And that's exactly what the apartheid regime was trying to do here, by letting those privileges only be given to white privileged members of society and ensuring that other minorities could not attain uh, these avenues toward gaining wealth. And eventually that meant avenues toward gaining power. They were able to subjugate the vast majority of South Africans while privileging the select few. With such different histories and such different paths of evolution over the past century, half century, it's not surprising that, ver that neighboring areas of Johannesburg can look completely different demographically, uh, just physically even, in the types of businesses they own and the amount of wealth that's concentrated in those particular neighborhoods. Like right now, you saw what Fordsburg looked like. It could be anywhere in the Eastern Hemisphere. And here right now, I just took a, a taxi maybe like two or three kilometers away. And I could be in Seattle. I could be somewhere in Scandinavia right now. Uh, and it's quite startling. You just get into an Uber and 10 minutes later, you feel like you're, you're not even in the same continent anymore, demographically, culturally. Um, the vibe just completely changes. And it's this diversity the startling diversity which makes it really difficult for me to tackle Johannesburg especially in a couple days I mean it's, it's a large city in and of itself but it's just the diversity in how people have been living in different bubbles over the past hundred years that it makes it really really difficult for a visitor to come in and understand exactly what the city is about um, so this bridge connects one side of the railway to the other side of the railway track right so by having this piece here, if you think about the idea of a password, so a password is about keeping your information safe and keeping my information safe. Yes, somehow the world shares the same sort of password. So as much as we try and be different from each other, these passwords still connect us in some sort of weird way. Same thing with this bridge over here. It was built to be, or this piece was put here to sort of chip into the...
Yeah, I'm with our, my host for this afternoon, Ayanda. Hello everyone, how are you? He's been taking me around Bramfontein right now, Bramfontein, yeah. this part of the city. Yeah. I don't have trouble pronouncing some of the Dutch names ah, here. It's okay, it's okay. It's Bra okay Bramfontein. It's okay. Yeah. And then we're crossing the Mandela Bridge over to the, the, the center of Johannesburg. Yes. So right in front of me, you see all like the big corporate buildings. And then behind me, we got to check out a bunch of the street art and graffiti. I learned about the difference between the two yes, terms, yes, 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 as well as the different types of graffiti and the hierarchy yeah, yeah. in uh, graffiti and oh, etiquette and etiquette amongst graffiti artists. Yes. So you'll probably see a couple shots of, of all that put up right about now. Yeah. Um, and now I, so, uh, something else which uh, was really, really interesting. I've always been thinking about and talking to you about and I asked Ayanda about was just about how every neighborhood in Johannesburg is just completely different. It tells a yeah. different story. Yes. It's yes. a different population, each with their own experiences and, and history. And yeah. they come to Johannesburg, they settle down and they make that neighborhood their own. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. So that's why everything we've seen today, yeah. I mean, I told you, we, went, we started off in, in Mar Mar Marshall, Marshalltown, Marshalltown, Marshalltown yes. the Fordsburg, now we're in Bramfontein, oh, and then yeah. yesterday we saw Soweto, Melville, yes. Parkhurst, all the very yeah, different. Completely <laughs> different, but all part of the same city. Just my, migration, man. People come from different places, different backgrounds, different lived experiences. And the reason they come to the different city is diverse. Some for work, some for better quality of life, um, some to visit, some trying to make it big. Uh, and because of the sort of reasons that they come, they will always find like-minded individuals, they'll gather in one space, hence these different sort of blocks or silos, I call them silos, silos uh, yeah. different silos good that exist oh. in the city. Silos yeah. is a great term, that's yeah. exactly what it feels like. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you will go to one area, the vibe there is completely different, you cross the road, vibe there completely different, but it's all one big city, um, you know, the diversity can be confusing, uh, so today we're just trying to contextualize why exactly. the city is so different from one block to the next block. Right, yeah. and I learned so much about, It's. I, I mean, we talk about redlining in the US, we talk about white flight, capital flight, and it's very much the same yes, yes. phenomenon that we yeah. we, we see here that yeah, you've yeah. been telling me about Ayanda, yeah, about yeah. how, you know, whites left the center of the city yes, to the yes. suburbs and now the suburbs are the most expensive part of the city. Yes, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we have people from the townships, other yeah. parts of uh, of South Africa now coming yeah. into, into what the was the, the city of Johannesburg. Yes, yes. And so it's changing, the dynamics are changing. Definitely. Um, from pre-democracy, post-democracy, yes. Um, and then, um, you know, so just beyond that, the average age, the city's becoming a lot more younger yeah. now. Uh, but yes, 100%, Joburg did go through, uh, we call it similar to you, what, um, yeah, similar to what Nikhil has just said, uh, capital flight and white flight. Capital flight is simply the businesses leaving the city center to the new central business district in the more affluent areas, Rose outskirts of the city more to the more wealthier residential sort of uh, yeah, area so this is a term that's very synonymous with the sort of story and history of Joburg especially post-democracy white flight and capital yeah. yeah I mean it's amazing how you call everything post-democracy and that's not that's so recent yeah. yes that's like, yes. Le like 30 less than 30 years less ago than 30, yeah so that's between I mean, 1990 so that's 32 years eh? yeah, 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 yeah 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 so our issue is very recent which I think sometimes uh, yeah, I think sometimes people forget about uh, uh, you know, sometimes you can be impatient that um, South Africa is definitely not where we want it to be, but it's also not as far back as sometimes we right, think right. it out to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a very, very recent sort of history because right. uh, the transition just happened in 1990. Um, so, yeah, I think um, if you compare us to some of the bigger cities of the world, South Africa is literally, or Johannesburg uh, is 1886, so 100 and 30 odd years, you know, compared mm -hmm. to some of the other cities, which are 300, 400, 600. So it's still a city trying to figure itself out. Is what yeah, I personally yeah. believe, hence you have all of these sort of silos because everybody's trying to dictate what the city should be for them. Uh, and nobody's got this one sort of common view of what Johannesburg the city right. should be. Um, what, was the, the, what was the name of the act which specified oh, that yes. each uh, race had oh, their own yes. uh yeah spot. so the group areas act group areas yeah, act, the group areas areas look act up. was an act um during apartheid which uh, sort of dictated where different races could live most of the city and urban spaces was for white south africans and then on the outskirts of the city would be where you'd find all the non-white south africans so it'd be black colored indians uh chinese or asian 
Were um, they even like divided up? Like black people had their own, Indian yes. had their own, Chinese yes, had their own? Yes, yes, yes. It was very little mixing. It was like, this is yeah. a black neighborhood. This is an Indian neighborhood. It's a colored neighborhood. This is a Asian or Chinese neighborhood. Right. Uh, so even within those non-white stuff, there were still racial divisions. Uh, and I mean, also some of it was um, some of the races, well, like the native races or the blacks are not as good as we are. So yes, we may be less than whites, yeah. but we're not as bad as right, black. right, exactly. So it's like a racism going in all directions. In all directions, yeah. You have uh, Indian people being racist to black people, black people, and then white people racist. being ra racist to everybody. Everybody, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's, that's uh, the, yeah, that, that, that's still. Uh, I think it's know, still at play today. I'm sure. A, yeah. yeah, no, hundred percent. Hundred. You know, I mean, yeah. I think these days we like to say colorism. Yeah, uh, colorism. You know, but uh, same thing still happens. Yeah, in South Africa. 100. I mean, Gandhi's whole story in South Africa was to fight for the rights of Indians. Yeah. Uh, and as part of that, it was kind of like, don't compare the Indians to the uncivilized, uneducated native tribes. Yeah. We are yeah. more educated. Exactly. You've colonized us in India, and you've seen what happens when you educate us. So please yeah. don't compare us to the natives, barbarian things. Yeah, so yeah. this is very much attitude that is not as bad as it is or not as bad as it was back in the day but it's still definitely yeah, prevalent yeah, yeah. Uh, to this uh, to this day so yeah it's just like a multitude of factors <laughs> that just dictates everything i mean it's such a it's see. such a complex place it's such yeah, a complex yeah, place no 100 yeah. percent uh and when we got to gandhi square they were in absolute disbelief they're like what in the world is going on here why is a statue of gandhi yeah in the middle of the city right um you not know because this guy was telling me it's like in India there's a caste or caste system however you want to right, say your right, age right. and Gandhi was obviously from a caste or caste uh, where you could be a lawyer yeah, right? yeah yeah so they were like we are not from that caste system so yeah. we ourselves as people from India don't like Gandhi yeah um, and then you know it's explained things like yo uh, a lot of South African history is very much just like uh, very new um, and people or leaders are celebrated without being investigated thoroughly who they were you know everyone just takes the positive side of them right. and never really investigates their full story and right. Gandhi is a good example of that uh, but there is a big you know, crossword there is sort of a huge conversation now currently about Gandhi okay to be like um, who was he uh, yes he was racist uh, let's understand him better instead of just celebrating him as this sort of i mean every, everybody's a complex figure right yes, you know, yes you could yes. you could have done something like, he yeah. was like the first for a lot of, of like uh yeah. of the south asians here in south africa yes and yeah. you can respect that but also yeah. criticize him for what he wasn't you know yeah at the same yeah. time and, um, you can't just put someone a, on a pedestal yeah. with, without criticizing them yeah and i think what's also important is uh when gandhi came to south africa he was not coming for to fight anything yeah he was just invited here by an indian business person who needs some, needed some legal help on his arrival in south africa because back in india he was seen as an educated lawyer whereas here in south africa he was treated as a second class citizen where as soon as he arrived he jumped onto i think it was a stagecoach what they called him back then uh but he was very unhappy with his treatment right to be like the, the person that was like controlling the stagecoach like hey man go and sit there yeah. With the, the blacks yeah you don't sit with the white people over here so coming from india where you treat it like respect to south africa where you dress as i think you barista or whatever yeah. the term they use it and then you arrive here and you all of a sudden sat next to this native who you look down upon was a big mental shift for him and this sort of is what inspires gandhi's whole stay right, right. in south africa yeah. was that sort of interaction you first had where coming from india where this person of respect to South Africa, where he's a second class citizen, uh, and this sort of informed his entire sort of journey through South Africa, fighting for the rights, not just of all Indians, but of the more case of the more Indians, privileged, of the Indians. more privileged, yes. uh, yeah, exactly, sort of exactly. Indian. So that is really a part of Gandhi's legacy or Gandhi's legacy that is not spoken about or not touched upon. Uh, but it I seems like more people know about that here in South Africa than they know about that in India than they know yeah. about it in the US. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it's also here in South Africa, to be fair, it's a very new sort of uh -huh. discussion because for a very long time, people did not want to bring this to the fore and Gandhi was just celebrated as this peaceful, resistant person who was all about peace and was perfect. Oh.